Um, I have a few announcements today and some wonderful information to share. Um, as for announcements, I do want to let you know um, that Nan Hawkins and Mr. Clyde's brother-in-law, Herb Ross, passed away this week, so please keep Miss Opal um, and that family in your prayers. Uh, we also have Cookie Express sheets that are floating around. If you haven't already filled one out, do so and get them back to Brenda or um, Miss Miriam. Then, offering envelopes are on the table set up right outside the choir room, just past the big tree in the foyer. So if you have, in fact, requested offering envelopes, they should be there. Um, if there's an issue with that, you can just uh, call Dottie in the church office or email her, and that information's on your bulletins. Sam Fulmer is the congregational care team member on call this week, and now I get to get to good stuff. You want to hear the good stuff? Thank you, Katrina. Good stuff. Okay. I'm telling y'all. So, here's the good stuff. Salvation Army, you all showed up. Not only did you show up, you outdid yourselves. We thought we would try for 75. We challenged ourselves to do 150 to really help all of the least of these in this community. Well, not only did you do 150, you exceeded that. We were able to shop for an additional almost 20 children. And not only that, the oldest of ones that are the ones that are so hard to shop for and get gifts for, especially when times are tough. So the Salvation Army truck showed up on Friday and the truck was as big as this chancel and then some, and I've decided three as tall as me, two and a half of Jacob. Maybe three of Jacob, I'm not sure. But anyway, it was a big truck. And we filled it from front to back and halfway high. And when the gentlemen who came to pick all the stuff up, they were so lovely, they explained to us that for children in this community, what we had provided, they have between 20 and 30 times that amount. So I do believe that the children in this community have been covered beautifully for Christmas this year, and thank you all so much for your part in that. From shopping and supporting and donations, we really were able to make a difference in the lives of those little ones, and I'm so grateful for that, and you all should give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> the last exciting piece, because I don't have to do it. Oh, okay, that was inappropriate. Um, Christmas concert is next Sunday at 7 p.m., and that is going to be fun. It's going to be in, oh, it's going to be beautiful, too. Not just fun. And it's going to be in the fellowship hall. And we'll even have little savory things for you to go ahead and eat and drink while you come. So just do come at 7 p.m. next Sunday so you can hear a bunch of people in the church share their gifts and talents with you. And on that, I invite you to stand as you're able, and we'll sing our first hymn.
Last week, we began our Advent season with the lighting of the candle of hope. Today, we light the candle of peace. Our scripture is Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. See, I am sending my messenger to prepare the way before me, and the God whom you seek will suddenly come to the temple. The messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, indeed, he is coming, says God. But who can endure the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. The prophet Malachi declares that God is on the way, and so is God's messenger, John the Baptizer, all dressed up in camel hair and eating locusts dipped in honey. But who can stand, the prophet asks, when God arrives as refiner's fire? Remember, the purpose of both a refiner's fire and fuller's soap is to refine and strengthen, not destroy or exclude. A refiner makes stronger, more beautiful metal. A fuller makes stronger, more beautiful cloth. And they do these things through simplification. Specks of non-metal and non-cloth are removed, resulting in a better, simpler, stronger material. Accordingly, the message here is that God will bring out the very best in each one of us, cleansing our hearts of pettiness and contempt healing our wounds so that we can live into God's sweet realm of peace and the justice that leads to peace. The promise of Advent is that a whole new world is coming into being, stronger and more beautiful in our hearts and in our neighborhoods. Thanks be to God. Will you join me in prayer? Dear God, fill us with your beauty and glory. Simplify us, refine us, help us change our hearts and our communities in ways we need to change so that all of your children may inherit a world full of justice and peace. In Jesus' name, with the prayer he taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. long-expected Jesus, born to set your people free. From our fears and sins release us, let us find our rest in thee. Israel's strength and consolation, hope of all the earth you are, dear desire of every Joy of every longing heart. Born the people to deliver, born a child and yet a king, born to reign in us forever, now thy gracious kingdom bring. My
us make our hearts your own. Come thou long expected Jesus, born to set thy people free. From our fears and sins release us, let us find our rest in thee. Israel's strength and consolation, hope of all the earth you are, dear desire of every nation, joy of every longing heart. Come now, great Redeemer, come Emmanuel. to save your very own long expected Jesus make our hearts your own come now long expected Jesus come now long expected Jesus when we come to this table, I wonder what it is that you expect. I know that I expect a place where I can lay my burdens down and leave them here. I expect a place that through this spiritual food I can be fed. I expect a table that is for everyone, not just First Christian Church or a select few. Will you pray with me? Dear Lord, we come to your table today and we empty ourselves of all that burdens us. We let go of the pain, the fear, and the worry, and we replace it with the hope and the peace that only you can bring. Let this spiritual food be enough. Let your words be enough, your teachings, and most importantly, let us remember that your grace is enough. Amen. On that night, so long ago, in the upper room, Jesus met with his disciples. And after a period of time, he picked up the bread. I imagine they were talking amongst themselves, not paying a whole lot of attention. And he held the bread and he blessed it. And he broke it. And he said, take, eat. This is my body broken for you. And in like fashion, he picked up the cup also. He blessed it. And he said, this is my blood of the new covenant. Every time you eat of this bread or drink from this cup, do so in remembrance of me.
are the gifts of God. We now come to the time in our service where we have an amazing opportunity. The opportunity to give back to the one who has given us so much every day, every moment of every time that we, we are alive. This is an amazing opportunity. So let us now come and give as we are able to make his kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. Let us give with happy hearts and smiling faces.
And this season of Advent is becoming more and more important to me with each passing year. I didn't grow up in a liturgical tradition, and the growing familiarity I have with this time of year is one in which I find myself being transformed in some important ways. And I recognize the opportunity that each one of us has to grow in our awareness of the reality of God, to grow in our awareness of the hope that is available to us, to grow in our awareness of the peace that is available to us, the joy that is available to us, and above all, the love, the all-encompassing love of God that is available to us. Many of you have probably already begun to experience the rush, the busyness of these weeks that lead up to Christmas morning. And each year, with the best of intentions, I think I'm not going to let that happen this time. Only to look back somewhere around the new year and realize much of it has passed by in a blur. Have you ever experienced that? You were intentional. You were thinking, that's not going to happen this year. This year, I'm not going to let that happen. And nevertheless, it happens again. There was something about the words of Mary that struck me in a particular way, and that's what has inspired the theme of this Advent season for me, pondering, pondering the meaning of Christmas, pondering the meaning of Christmas. In Luke's account, when Jesus was born, the shepherds arrived as they were directed by the angel to arrive. There were others who were gathered there, and after the shepherds had disclosed to Mary and Joseph, in the hearing of those who were gathered, it said that those who had gathered were amazed at what they heard. But Mary, but Mary treasured all of these words. She treasured all of these words, and she pondered in her heart their meaning. She pondered them in her heart. That word heart in Greek is the word cardia doesn't mean merely emotions. It means our thoughts, our beliefs, our value systems, our hopes, our aspirations, the fundamental intentions, the purpose of our lives, the very center of our being. She treasured all of these words, and she pondered them in her heart. She treasured all of these words and she pondered them in the very core of her being. This week we have an opportunity to ponder the meaning of Christmas and ponder what it means to have peace with God. What does it mean to have peace with God. With that question in mind, let's turn our attention to the gospel according to St. Luke. I'm going to be reading a familiar passage, which makes it no less easy to read, as you will discover. I'm going to be reading verses 1 through 6 of chapter 3. In the 15th year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, And Herod was ruler of Galilee, and his brother Philip, ruler of the region of Etruria and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, ruler ruler of Abilene, during the priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas. Anybody want to come up and read that part for me again? (laughs) The word of God 
came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Treasuring all of these words, pondering them in our heart, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare, prepare, prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth, and all flesh shall see the the salvation of God. May our lives be transformed by the reading, hearing, and internalizing of these words. Amen. How is it that we can increase our capacity to experience peace with God. I often say to Valerie, I often say to Jillian and Beth and Dottie and Lorianne, the people that I encounter either at home or within this building on a consistent basis, that these messages are messages that speak to me as much and perhaps more than they do those who gather to hear the message. And I remind people on a regular basis that I am the mere messenger. And the message for me is in many ways overwhelming because I do not know how to express, communicate, the power of these messages with mere words. It's often the case by Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday, this message is still speaking to me after I've shared it. And I grow in my recognition of the importance of the message. And this is one of those weeks where I realize the power, the potential of this message to be truly life-transforming. And life-transforming in the sense that we can grow in our capacity to experience peace with God. How many of you would love to experience a greater degree of peace with God? It's okay to raise your hand if you want to. Many of us, me included, I can find myself anxious I can find myself concerned. I can find myself worried. At times, I can find myself fearful. And in any given moment, I'm not experiencing the peace of God. I'm anxious. I'm thinking about things perhaps in the future. Perhaps I'm wrestling with things that I don't have control over. Maybe I'm wrestling with some things I had control over but didn't address properly. And now I'm in a situation that's creating some anxiety. For many of us, there are circumstances that we really have no control over. We didn't create the circumstances. And now really there's not a whole lot we can do about them. And we find ourselves anxious. We're worried about it. And yet, in the words of Paul in his letter to the church in Philippi, he says, do not be anxious about anything. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. He goes on to say this, Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, 
think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. In these two passages that I've referenced this morning, we discover the way in which we can grow in our capacity to experience peace with God. So let's explore these together. Beginning with John, John the Baptist, son of Zechariah, prepare, prepare, prepare the way, prepare. The peace of God is from first to last a matter of grace. And grace is an unearned and unmerited gift from God. And yet we're called to prepare. Peace is, in reality, grace from first to last. Grace is the gift of peace. And yet we're called to prepare. For a long time, our response ability eluded me. If it's the grace of God, and if it is unearned and unmerited, then what is there for us to do? And that was because I didn't recognize that there is a profound difference between engaging in effort and earning something. Now, this is a difficult thing, I assure you. This is a difficult thing for us to get our minds around, but it's so important that we do. It's important that we do because each one of us has a profound longing to experience greater degrees of peace with God. Not one of us likes to be anxious. Not one of us likes to be worried. Not one of us likes to be afraid, do we? And so we want to have an actual insight into how it is that we're going to grow in this peace. This is not just some arbitrary or trivial matter. This is a matter of our mental well-being. This is a matter of our emotional well-being. This is a matter of our spiritual well-being. The stakes are high, aren't they? So we don't really have any business gathering on a Sunday morning to speak in platitudes about the peace of God that surpasses all understanding, do we? Is this real or is it not? Can we really experience the peace of God in circumstances that are overwhelming us? Can we really? Or do we just keep repeating a platitude about the peace of God? Now, we want to grow in our capacity to experience the peace of God, and that's the reason we want to do some of the mental labor if we have to, so that we can better understand how to experience it, right? See, the grace of God is the source of our peace. It is the grace of God that takes the initiative toward us. It is the grace of God that even gives us the desire for the peace. And in the simplest terms I know how to communicate it, I'm beginning to understand it this way. Without God, we cannot experience the peace, the true peace of God. Without God, we cannot experience peace. Without God, we cannot experience peace. But without our response to God's initiatives, we will not experience God's peace. It is the grace of God that gives us the capacity to respond to God. 
We are not earning the peace of God when we respond to the peace of God that God took the initiative to give us. Gave us the capacity with which to respond. And yet, it does require effort on our part. This is not merely a passive endeavor, waiting on the peace of God to show up in my life. There's some preparation that has to take place. We have to treasure all of these words and ponder them at the core of our being. How many of you know intellectual work is some of the most difficult work we will ever do? We have to exert extraordinary effort to gain insights into the realities of God. For many of us, we want to be amazed by these words. but We don't treasure them. We don't ponder them in our hearts. What is the meaning of this? What is the meaning that the Lord, the Lord, entered into human form and was born in a manger? Are we treasuring these words, these accounts? Are we pondering them in our hearts? What does it mean to have peace with God. What does it mean to experience the peace of God? What does it mean to prepare? There's something for us to do in order to grow in our capacity to experience the peace of God and to have peace with God, we have to prepare. There are some things we're called to do. Even the recognition that we're called to prepare, the capacity to prepare, the desire to prepare, and the ability to prepare are all a matter of God's grace. Without God's grace, we wouldn't even recognize any of it. But by the grace of God, we can prepare. If we're going to grow in our capacity to experience peace with God, we can prepare. The next thing we can do is present. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything. I'm going to say it one more time. Do not be anxious about anything. And you can pull it up, Milton. It's the first verse in Philippians. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, Make your request known to God. I believe a better translation is present your request to God. Present your request to God. God already knows what they are. But we can present them. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, present your request to God. Not just when things or contrary to circumstances that we would have chosen for ourselves, not just when we find ourselves anxious. In everything, present your request, present your concerns, present what's causing you to be anxious, present your doubts. How many of you know that God can handle our doubts? I am surprised time and again how many times I hear from people that they were taught that they weren't supposed to doubt. That doubt was a sign of a lack of faith. But the truth is, God wants us to grow in our relationship with God. It's okay to be honest with God. God, I have some doubts. I have some doubts. 
I'm not sure what happens to me when it's time to lay this body down. I have some doubts. I believe, and yet I have some doubts. And my doubts are causing me some worry. I have some doubts about your nature. Sometimes I wonder if you are an all-loving God and you're a creator of all that is, then why do terrible things happen? Why do terrible things happen to really good people? It's causing me to doubt some things. I'm not sure. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, present your request, present your anxieties, present your doubts. Grow in your relationship. God can handle our doubts. Grow in your relationship, not just when it gets bad, not just when there's a crisis, in everything with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Present your joys, present your concerns, present your worries, present your doubts. And as you grow in that relationship, as you present to the one who's greater than I am alone, I'm beginning to experience the peace of God that surpasses my ability to comprehend it. Everything around me says, I shouldn't have peace, and yet I do. We prepare. We present. The next one is practice. Practice. Let's look at this again. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. We're presenting. Practice. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Practice. Think about these things. Practice the intentionality of what we're thinking about, seizing our thoughts, transcending our thoughts, having the ability to see what we're thinking about. We don't have to be controlled by our thoughts. That's part of what it means to be created in God's image. We have limited transcendence. We can rise above our thoughts and look at what we were thinking about. That's an extraordinary capacity that we take for granted, isn't it? Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Practice. Practice being present with your thoughts. Practice being aware of your thoughts. Practice being aware of the impulse to share your negative thoughts with someone else and disrupt their intentionality about thinking about these things. I did it early this morning with Jillian. A negative thought crossed my mind. There was something that I thought needed to be addressed. It was something that could have been addressed early. I walked over there and said some things that were contrary to excellence and praiseworthy and realized a few minutes later and walked back over and said, I apologize for that. And she said, that's okay. I didn't let it disturb me. We can be aware when other folks are beginning to express those thoughts that are less than excellent and praiseworthy and recognize we don't have to internalize those. But it takes practice, doesn't it? It takes practice. Louis Armstrong it's a wonderful quote that I came across. Some of you will recognize it. If I don't practice for a day, I know it. If I don't practice for two days, the critics know it. If I don't practice for three days, the public knows it. Are we practicing our thoughts? Are we practicing the thoughts of peace? Are we practicing the thoughts of what's true, what's honorable, what's excellent and praiseworthy? Are we practicing and are we doing these things? 
we're on display. I'm on display. You all are on display more than we realize sometimes, aren't we? If we haven't been practicing these things, for a day, maybe we just know it. After two days, our critics, who are our critics? The ones our lives intersect with on a regular basis, our families, our co-workers, people at the grocery store, our social groups. If we've not been practicing for a couple of days, people are beginning to notice it. Jacob hadn't been practicing lately. There's not a lot of peace there. And after three days, the world knows it. You've seen those people in public, haven't you? They haven't been practicing taking control of those thoughts, practicing putting those things in practice. And on any given day, that person is me in public. So we want to be intentional about practicing our thoughts. Again, this is no small or trivial matter. And it is both my great luxury, it is an extraordinary privilege, and it is, at times, a heavy burden. As I said from the outset, these messages are so much bigger than the messenger, and this message will continue to speak to me because I didn't sit down to write an essay that I would then communicate verbally, orally, on Sunday morning. I didn't, I'm not the source of this. I am learning from what it is that I'm sharing with you. But I came across an analogy that I deeply appreciate when it comes to these matters of faith and matters of our hope and matters of our peace and matters of our joy and the greatest reality of love. And it's an analogy with respect to a game. Not game in the sense of something that's unimportant, but how games properly understood are supposed to be practiced, how the game is supposed to be practiced. So let's talk about the game, if you will, of faith. And this is a serious game. It's not a game in the way that we think of game. The game of peace. In order for it to be a real game, it has to have a purpose. It has to have some rules. And those who are participating have to have the right disposition, the right attitude. For those of you who have heard me before, I often say that we have to know God as God is. We have to have the right disposition. We have to want to know God as God is and not God as we would have God to be. This helps us get closer to what I'm trying to communicate. We have to have the right attitude. Now see, in games, there are different ways of approaching the game. There are some who approach the game in a way that is less than how we are supposed to approach the game. And these are the people who trivialize the game in many ways. They don't understand the importance of it. They really don't understand the importance of this game. An example was given, it's something akin to say there are two people who are playing checkers. And one person is actually engaged in the game of checkers. And the other one is just kind of moving those discs around the board with no real interest in the game itself. They may be amusing the person that they're engaged with, but they don't really have an appreciation of the purpose of that game. It's a trivial matter. They're going through the motions, but they don't have an appreciation of the purpose of that game. The other people who are spoil sports, they recognize neither the importance of the game, nor do they care about the rules. It's just all about them. And if it's not going according to the way they want it to go, they'll take their ball and go home. And then there are the cheaters. 
They understand the purpose of the game, but they don't respect the rules. They just want to win. They just want to get what they want. They're not concerned with the rules. I was thinking about that in terms of our peace. For some of us, we don't understand the importance of what it is that we're doing here. We haven't developed an appreciation of the importance of what we're doing here. In some ways, we've trivialized it. We're going through the motions. We might even enjoy it, more or less. We're getting something out of it. But we don't really understand the magnitude. We don't appreciate the importance of what we're doing. For some of us, we show up and it's all about us. It's about me. And if I'm not getting what I want, I'm going to take my ball and go home. I'm going to go somewhere else where I can get what I want. What it is that I think I need. And then there are others of us, we see the importance of it. but we want to take the shortcuts. And I came to see it this way, and this was when the light bulb came off. Many of us want the peace of God, but we're not interested in peace with God. We want the benefit of the peace of God, but we don't want to cultivate. We don't want to prepare. We don't want to present. We don't want to practice. We want the peace of God, but we're not pursuing peace with God. Do you see the difference? The peace of God is when we're thinking the thoughts of God when we're practicing God's will, when we're presenting our hopes, our joys, our doubts, our concerns, our worries, we're developing our relationship with God. We're preparing. We're removing those things that would be a source of anxiety. We're preparing. And now we've cultivated a relationship with God. And now we've cultivated peace with God. And now because we've cultivated peace with God, we're experiencing the peace of God. My prayer for us this Advent season is that we will prepare. We'll recognize that God is taking the initiative And by the grace of God, we have the capacity to respond to those initiatives. And we'll engage in the effort. We'll prepare. My prayer is that we will present in everything our concerns, our hopes, our doubts, our fears, and that we will practice the thoughts. We will practice the will of God. If we do so, we will experience the peace with God and in so doing, we'll also experience the peace of God. That's my prayer for you and that's my prayer for me this morning. Amen. I invite you to stand as you're able and allow God to take the initiative Show us some ways we can prepare, each one of us personally. Show us what it is that we need to present. And show us some of the practices that we can get engage in so that we can experience the peace of God and experience peace with God as well.
the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. The peace that is ours as we present our request to God. As we prepare, empowered by God's grace. As we practice the thoughts and the will. May the peace of God that comes from peace with God guard our hearts and minds this second Advent Sunday and forevermore. Amen.